Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grilling JR with the voice of professional wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Unfortunately, Jim is still in the hospital trying to uh, rehab from not one, but two surgeries. But we are very thankful that JR is on the mend. Uh, rehab has begun. He is working hard. And as you might imagine from hearing JR over the years here on the program, he ain't exactly thrilled about it. But as he would say, don't worry about the mule, just load the damn wagon. That's what we're trying to do here on a very special remix edition of our very first Elimination Chamber episode. That's right. Way back when the Elimination Chamber was first debuted in Survivor Series 2002, we're going to be running that one back today to get you ready for next week's Elimination Chamber. And just announced, looks like they're going to have Seth and Cody on the Waller effect. Hmm. You smell what I'm cooking? Could we get some advancement on the road to WrestleMania? Of course, way back when at the Elimination Chamber in Madison Square Garden, we had Triple H defending his world title against a whole cast of characters. Shawn Michaels and his doo-doo brown tights. Chris Jericho, Kane, Booker T, and Rob Van Dam. There's a lot to talk about there. First of all, the doo-doo brown tights, the little Dutch boy haircut. How about RVD falling on Triple H's throat? And of course, we had the six, the SmackDown six, rather, face off in a tag battle. We got Big Show challenging Brock Lesnar for the WWE title. And how about this? Scott Steiner debuted on this pay-per-view. It's absolutely action-packed. You don't want to miss it. I'm looking forward to it. I think you will too. And I got to tell you, I'm also looking forward to helping some people save money in the new year. That's what I do with my real life. But one of the pro tips I've found along my journey to figuring out how to save more money is rocket money. And if you're like me, you probably think you have a handle on what all you're paying for with your subscriptions. I know I thought I did. Turns out not so much. The wife and I both signed up for a streaming service, but we watch TV together. Well, we fix that and a whole lot more. In total, we saved over $1,000 a year, and I think you're going to be shocked at how much money you can save when you check out Rocket Money. It's a personal finance app that finds and cancels all of your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills. You can see all of your subscriptions in one place, and if you see something you don't want, you can cancel it with a tap. That's it. Never pick up the phone and talk to customer service. No emailing back and forth. And check this out. Rocket Money will even try to help get you a refund for the last couple of months of wasted money. And they can even negotiate to lower your bills for you, but up to 20%. All you got to do is take a picture of your bill and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and they've helped save some of their members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. So stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash JR. That's rocketmoney.com slash JR, rocketmoney.com slash JR. And now let's get to Survivor Series 2002, the very first Elimination Chamber. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grilling JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how are you, man? Conrad, you are a full-sized man full of P&V today. I love it. I can, I can feel it. I can sense it. I got to have it. <laughs> so everything's good here, man. I, I had a, I still deal with this frigging, uh, wound. Boy, these wound care people are serious. Oh yeah. Yeah, I went to my first appointment and had a, I thought it was going to be about 30 minutes. It's three hours. Oh yeah. And, and here's what happens there mentally. You have three hours to, to contemplate your fate. Well, what if they find cancer back? What if they, what if, what if, what if? So it's uh very unsettling to say the least, but, and then, then to get the news, well, it's probably going to take six more months of healing. And, I, and they want me to do the hyperbaric chamber, but here's the problem with that. They want to do it every day. Well, that's tough. I said, I can't do it every day. I just can't. I, I'm, I work, I have a job. I have, I make commitments professionally that I'm going to maintain and, 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 and keep. So it's just a, it's not a matter of putting my job before my health. It right. sounds like it. 
Now, if I wasn't working, I'd, I'd go along with her plan, but still it's four months right. of hyperbaric chamber stuff. So he's going to try to treat it without using the hyperbaric chamber or whatever it's called. And, uh, we'll see how, how it goes. I just have to, it's just a fait accompli. I, I just have a, I have an issue here and it's, I didn't plan on it, but I have an issue here that we just got to address. And I told the doctor, I said, we have to be creative doc. You know, we have to, we can't just get in the rut of, okay, this is how you do this. There's gotta be other options. And he said, well, there are some other options. Well, let's explore them. Simple, right? Connie. You just, yeah. Yeah. You got a problem. You got a business problem. You got to find solutions. Got to adapt. So that's where we are. So, uh, it's all good. Plus I'm excited. Uh, and this football season is getting exciting. Yeah. We're actually recording this episode in advance. Uh, I'm actually going to be out of town for a bit. So as you and I are recording, we don't know yet who won between Tennessee and Georgia, but we just saw the first version of the uh, college football playoff uh, rankings. Right. And, uh, boy, I'm pretty excited. I think you are too. And this is what makes college football so fun, man. Week to week. It's just, uh, it's the end all be all. It's the classic example of episodic booking. Yes. The college football playoffs and, and getting all this stuff done in advance is episodic booking, Connie. And it gives everybody a chance to be their own booker, pick their own games. And so I, I, uh, I just love that whole theory concept, whatever you want to call it, but it's, uh, it's coming down to some really interesting things and, and they have surpassed the NFL, in my opinion, as far as the emotional attachment to your team, for sure, you go to Philly, you might get an argument because their Eagles are undefeated. They love, they love their team. They're passionate, but the fans in, uh, Des Moines are not as excited about the, the Eagles as the Eagle fans are, you know what I mean? It's just. It's, it's crazy how this thing is working out, but college football is, that's the, uh, that's the money to me. That's the money to me. And that's why we're all so passionate about the whole thing. As you said, I got to take you to an OU game. Yes. And you got to take me to an Alabama game. It's going to be fun. Yeah. It'd be good. We'll take some, it will take selfies. <laughs> well, we got us. So people knew we did it. Right. That's what everybody does. That's right. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful. Nobody was taking selfies about our topic today. It's survivor series, 2002, but boy, before we get to the show, we left off at no mercy and we are knee deep in Katie Vick. Yeah. Is that great? Here's what the observer had to say in a blatant attempt to create controversy and further enhance the character of Raw's chief antagonist, triple H last night's Monday night raw on TNN, which by the way, was rated TV 14. Presented an alleged act of necrophilia. Triple H poorly disguised as his chief adversary, Kane presented a skit in a funeral hall using a mannequin that simulated the body of Kane's former girlfriend, Katie Vick. WWE executive producer, Kevin Dunn stated that numerous warnings to WWE viewers about sensitive subject matter did air prior to the segment quote, while the subject matter is sensitive. On balance, this was an attempt at dark humor, capitalizing on the popularity of programs such as CSI, Six Feet Under, and X Files. My goodness! Stop! Just stop! My goodness! Yeah, that's what I say. Hey, set your fat ass out there at the ringside and try and, and commentate. You know, uh, I've always prided myself on being able. The most saying is the guys kid kidding me about it. You put the son of a bitch on the monitor, I can call it. Yes. Well, this was very challenging. Well, uh, yeah, you think so? What you know? What you do, Connie? You lay out. I was fixing to say, uh, it's like our parents taught us when we were kids. If you don't have anything nice to say, just don't say anything <laughs> at all. Yeah, that's right. So it was. Uh, I never understood the logic behind it. It failed miserably. It was in poor taste. I don't want to put a put programming on television where a dad who's getting a pass to watch wrestling on Monday night. Uh, has to explain to his kid what necro free necro is, whatever, whatever you say, yeah. are, are the, the sex components of this alleged storyline. That's not what you want to explain to a child or is, you want to make him a fan. And if you want heat on triple eights and shoot an angle with a baby face, not a mannequin. So I don't know. I, I, I never saw any value in it. I think it was embarrassing to wrestling and that's a big statement. When you can say blank is an embarrassment to pro wrestling. 
So, and I believe that to be true then. I believe it to be true now. Meltzer would say that, uh, well, he just recaps it. Triple H goes to the funeral parlor, which by the way, actually happened in Nashville. There was a real funeral going on on the other side of that wall. Open a supposed casket, take off the bra and panties of a supposed dead woman, take off his own clothes while wearing a cane mask, and then hop in the casket. He then portrayed himself having sex with the dead woman, leading to the punchline. Oh my God, I really did it. And as mush came out of the head, he said, I really screwed her brains out. That's well, so funny. Live, what a, what a... In, live in Nashville before one of the smaller raw crowds in years. Fans booed the segments with loud chance of refund during the commercial break for a company that claims to listen to its audience for direction. It sounded like a message. Then again, the constant chance of what as Kane was supposedly pouring his heart out and the lack of heat for their pay-per-view match after all this time was devoted in a unique way of not getting it over. It's listen, there's just no good in this. And Meltzer tries to say that. This is the new way of garnering controversy, the new fashioned way and quote, Jim Ross was talking about how they'd hear so much about it. And Jerry Lawler was picking fights with the internet nerds. So it feels as if this is Vince McMahon, just throwing his middle finger up at the critics, the, 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 the parent teacher councils, the, the Phil Mushnicks, the online know-it-alls, whatever the case may be, but at no point. Does anybody raise their hand loud enough to make this segment get scrapped? I mean, Jr. Bruce has said for years, he tried to talk them out of this and they did it so over the top. They thought, well, there's no way Vince will air this, but they did. And I'm curious from your perspective, you often say here on the show, I don't want to know what's going to happen. And as you said, a moment ago, put that some bitch on the monitor. I'll call it. Did you have right. any idea they were doing a segment like this? Or are you as shocked as the rest of us? I was uh, shocked and I, uh, knew the subject matter was going to be very, very delicate to say the very least, uh, but I didn't know all the specifics and all the machinations of how they're going to produce that segment. It was just horrible, just horrible. And I felt so bad for the audience and, you know, you can almost, uh, theoretically hear TVs clicking yeah. channels changing, I, you know. Again, if you've got to sit and explain a, a political, a religious, or a sexual angle to your audience, you're on the wrong road and you, you they, 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 uh, covet these kids for all the right reasons, primarily to create more cash. And it's, it's just, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's an amazing, I, I get a, at a loss for words, just thinking about. Again, I'm just trying to figure out why we did it. Right. Did you really believe it was going to work? Yeah. I wonder whose idea that was in the writing room. It had to be Vince, right? I don't know. Sometimes somebody would have a germ of an idea and he would then embellish it and make it his own. That could have been a case in this, in this matter. I've never heard a writer. Bruce, he might remember it better than me. Cause I had another job I was trying to get done. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know, I don't know why we, I don't know why we did it. And I don't know why, uh, it's, and now, and you, I've never heard any person in my life talk positively about this storyline. There's no redeeming, uh, qualities to this piece of shit. Excuse my language. No, all right. Well said, um, Meltzer would say Ross kept trying to utter the parody of the Tom Hanks line from a league of their own saying there's no necrophilia in wrestling. There's no semen in wrestling. You could see it was a game of how many times they could say those words to shock the audience, but the words meant nothing. The company with as much talent as any company in history has now become a sad parody of itself. All uh, has gone from hip and entertaining to aging and creepy. And it's impossible for the serious angles. If there are any to have any impact because he sells the most potentially offensive skits as comedy. Ross is in a dead position. He's an announcer known for calling great matches, having no great matches to call. He's caught between trying to maintain the drama that sells great confrontations and being placed in a comedy vein. 
that makes him foolish to try. He's making a great point here. If, if you're really the voice of wrestling and known to call all these great matches, but that's not really what we're doing anymore. <laughs> you're kind of in a can't win position here, right? Yeah. Well, it's not. Yeah, of course I, I was. And like I said, if I had to do all over again, I'd lay out more. Yeah. And, uh, all those little buzzwords that, you know, you st- the stimulators, uh, it's just, you, you can look at it any way you want. You can look at it from, well, we're trying to broaden our audience. We're trying to be sensationalistic. We're trying to be more like mainstream television, blah, blah, blah. Bottom line is you write television to entertain your audience. Yep. This did not entertain the audience and the audience that was there, uh, Give, uh, said amen to that. We don't like this. It's horrible. It's embarrassing. And what, and I can, I can imagine some diehard wrestling fan sitting at home, his buddies come over, they have a couple of beers to watch wrestling and this is on. And the guy had, he's a returning viewer. And then he's going to say, or she's going to say, so this is where we are now in this crazy world of pro wrestling. Well, it isn't, it is tonight. And I wonder how the quarter hours did with that piece of shit. I, I'd like to know how the, I'm curious. I don't need you to, you know, you don't know. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of your information, but it'd be interesting to know how the quarter hours did for that piece of business. Well, how about this? Meltzer has this to say, while WWE claims these aren't desperate times, their actions and product contradict that as do their declining business fortunes. This is a writing staff that is in way over its head, trying to please a boss who has forgotten what he was once great at taking people with limited talent and finding something in them to make them superstars. Instead, he's got the most talented roster he's ever had, but Amen. can't make anyone into stars. And he's murdered the star power of people who at one time were draws through a combination of overexposure and bad angles. So listen, this is, uh, This is tough and everybody knows it. Bill Moody, the Paul bear character that we've all fallen in love with in WWE for so many years. Yeah. Went on a a famous wrestling message board at the time called wrestling classics. And he wrote this about the segment. I am horrified. I never thought I would ever be proud to say that I do not work for Vince McMahon any longer. This feels like a company that at this point. GM 20 years ago had lost its way a little bit. And and it's easy from the outside looking in to say, well, what's different from O two to O one? Well, there's, there's no competition. There's no WCW and there's no ECW and we've gone public a few years ago. So most of the major players have probably, you know, now made the financial moves to be set for life. It feels as if. I don't know. Without a challenge, Vince just leaned into the lowest common denominator. I, I don't even know how we get to a necrophilia angle. I don't either. Yeah. I, I don't know what his motivation was. Uh, I guess we could, we could figure that out. He wants ratings, right? And ratings, uh, translate into dollars. And when you're a publicly traded company, that's the old stone cold line. And that's the bottom line. So I, I don't know. It, it, Sometimes I thought, well, he's trying to reinvent himself. He's trying to bring himself into the, to the future. Maybe, I don't know. Every time you try to come up with a solution or an answer, Conrad, it falls short. It falls short. So, uh, it was, it was probably one of the worst. I don't, I don't know if I've ever seen or been a party to worst creative. I know there was, you know, in Dallas had the Fritz von Eric heart attack and there's all kinds of things like that that went on, uh, over the years, right? Nothing on this level because of the exposure and the overlay of USA network, more people saw this shit than the, and saw the other, seen the other things. So it, it was just a, it was amazing. It was amazing. And, uh, I'm just glad Katie Vick didn't have a sister. Oh man. Me and you too. <laughs> it's unbelievable when you think about, you know, what I mean, the idea that this ever got on TV is just crazy, but let's remind everybody that 
right before this, the month prior is when this HLA, the hot lesbian action stuff really becomes a big deal on TV. So we're trying just all these crazy, outrageous, almost Jerry Springer esque type of angles right. to get some attention for ourselves. And well, it's just not working. Uh, something else oh. that's not working is three minute warning. Apparently, uh, one week when they attacked Pat Patterson, Jamal accidentally hurt Pat. I don't think anybody would intentionally hurt Pat, but no, the next week, well, he's got to be punished and we're going to do it on TV. So we're going to see big show defeat Rosie, Jamal and Rico in a three and one and Meltzer called it Jamal's punishment for hurting Pat Patterson. Do you remember that there being heat on Jamal for accidentally hurting Pat? Nothing to this extreme. Yeah. I mean, it was just a, Pat was older and he shouldn't have been in there doing that shit anyway. And, and, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, Jamal has known Pat Patterson, Jamal's entire life. So there's no, there's no heat. There's no issue. It was just a mistake. And, uh, so I don't know if it was punishment or not. I didn't dislike the three minute warning gimmick. Uh, you know, you hope that one of those guys will spin out and become a star. That was the idea generally is with the heel faction. You want somebody to, to, to bolt, become bigger than they were before they arrived. Uh, so I, I, I didn't dislike that, that situation, uh, but it's just, again, it's a pile on thing. And I don't know. I thought, I think I, I, I didn't have a problem with the three minute warning, get the gimmick, but I don't think Patterson was, uh, I don't think Pat was hurt badly. Right. No bruised up a little bit or jarred a little bit or whatever you want to say. Uh, and I'm not just throwing it off. Like it doesn't mean anything. I love Pat. I miss him to this very day. He would be, if Pat Patterson were alive today, uh, I can only imagine his sentiments on today's product of the business that uh, he helped uh, build quite frankly, no doubt. So listen, Kane and RVD are going to team up to take on flair and triple H. They go 12 minutes and 21 seconds. And of course you're still trying to get this angle over and Meltzer would even say this Jim Ross was apparently being paid a bonus. Every time he used the words semen and necrophilia. Now, of course he's saying that tongue in cheek, but this yeah. is the era where you've got the old man in your ear the entire night. And he oftentimes focuses on that main event and wants you to hammer that main event, or at least we've heard as fans. Yeah. Are, are these things that he's saying to you now, Jim, you got to make sure you get over it. Semen and necrophilia. Yeah. What did they say? Work. I want you to work semen into the into your, your presentation or, or necrophilia. I kept thinking about, you know, this, that how many households right. were forced into a situation where you, daddy or mom has got to explain to a kid what a lesbian is hot lesbian action. Well, what does that mean? Uh, necrophilia. Okay. What well, mommy, what's that? You know, what are you going to do to a 10 year old or a 12 year old kid? Uh, it's having sex with a dead person. Then, the, then that dialogue goes to another road and it's not healthy. It's not good. It's uncomfortable. I don't think that's like, you wonder how many kids stop watching raw or sports stop watching raw, uh, on, with grandpa, or grandma. Cause now they got to be the one to explain this insanity. It was just uh, it was crazy, Connie, really crazy. They're just, you keep, you can, we keep trying to find some redeeming quality. Yeah. There are none. So quit looking. There are none. Well, the, uh, the SmackDown show of course has Michael Cole on the call and he's trying to put over the undertaker Lesnar match. And supposedly you tell Michael Cole, as you're trying to coach him up, so to speak. Put over this Lesnar undertaker match as one of the most violent matches in WWE history. And Cole asked about the verbiage because supposedly the company is banned from using the word violent on their broadcasts. I guess you guys talk about it and Cole winds up referring to the match as one of the most intense and disturbing matches in WWE and history. And that works, but here's what's fascinating to me. The, the message comes down from on high. All right, guys, we can't say violent on the program anymore. Now don't forget to work in semen and necrophilia. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. No shit. The word violent belongs in a pro wrestling program. I could argue the other words never do. Correct. I agree with you. hundred percent. 
hundred percent. I agree with you. So yeah, it was just, uh, we've, we've booked, Vince booked us on a box and his, his box didn't have any doors. The windows were locked. There's no way to get out of it. Let's just blow up the house. And you know, thank God it didn't last forever. But hey, you're mentioning about the three minute warning and their situation with, with the big show. I believe I might be wrong. And of course, uh, Paul white still, uh, works for AEW see him occasionally. Uh, but man, uh, we never, WWE and, and myself never booked him. Well, right. Uh, we overexposed and he said, well, how, what do you mean by that? What specifically do you mean by that? Jr. He was overexposed. You cannot, if you're an amateur booker out there, or you're doing, you know, any form of administrative planning in pro wrestling, uh, you, 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 you just, you can't overexpose an attraction because they, guess what? They cease being an attraction. They're not new. They're not fresh. They're not different. They're not eye opening. So, uh, that's just another example of that deal because we just essentially destroyed those other three guys. And I didn't, I don't think that was a, there was a need for that, but nonetheless, uh, that was just a thought that popped in my head. I just think that big show was one of the most ill, ill booked, uh, talents on that level that we, that we ever had. Hey, let's talk about the observer sort of a, what if, uh, there were talks over the weekend that make the observer about Vince McMahon, trying to put together something with the Nevada state athletic commission in Las Vegas. Of course, this is all preliminary and I know what you're thinking. Why would Vince be calling the athletic commission in Nevada? Well, he has a big idea. Now context is King. Let's remind everybody that Mike Tyson took on Lennox Lewis in one of the biggest pay-per-view extravaganzas in boxing history in 2002. It was a monumental affair, but that was earlier in the year. And now Vince is looking for a shot in the arm. Hot lesbian action didn't do it. Katie Vick didn't do it. What if we had Lennox Lewis versus Brock Lesnar in Las Vegas for real? So there's at least preliminary discussions about trying to do this, uh, a match in February, sort of a build for WrestleMania. And I think this is an interesting idea. Once upon a time. Vince did promote a boxing pay-per-view with Sugar Ray. He had promoted other interesting spectacles like the Snake River Canyon thing with Evil Knievel. But now he has an interest in his next big thing, his world champ, fresh off of beating the Rock at, at, at SummerSlam. He's the top dog now. But Lennox Lewis has just beat Mike Tyson. What if we put them together? Sort of the guy who sits on top of boxing and the guy who sits on top of pro wrestling. It's an interesting idea. Right. What do you remember hearing about this? Well, we talked about it a lot, uh, and find that other, that next attraction, you know, everybody's trying to follow up with Mike Tyson, uh, on our experience in WWE with Mike Tyson, Tyson and Austin and all that stuff, uh, which I thought was so well done. Yeah. It was a big difference maker, but see, that was a, that was a booking that fans could relate to mm -hmm. Tyson was famous. He's an athlete. You know, uh, he expounded violence. You can say that again. Uh, so it was discussed. Vince even took, uh, I flew down with him and a few others, including my wife, Chan from, uh, white plains to Memphis, this to go see that Lennox Lewis, Lennox Lewis, Mike Tyson fight. And so we went, we were at that fight and, uh, cause we had that really, you know, Mike was kind of part of the family a little bit, you know, uh, and he, Mike was such a wrestling fan. It's kind of heartwarming that somebody with his stature, at least at that time, uh, was, uh, a huge fan. So it was, a, it was a long shot. We knew it was going to be a long shot because you're dealing with the, with an athletic commission that's pretty strong and they are pretty set in their ways. So it, it was going to be a long shot if we, if we could get it done. Uh, but I thought it was a very intriguing idea. I was interested in that. If we could pull it off, I wanted to call that, you know, I, that, that'd been a fun gig. 
So I, I, uh, it was so much red tape. You got to go through so much bureaucracy when you're dealing with an athletic commission as active as Nevada. My friend, Mark Ratner was the head of that group for years. Now he's with USC and what a sweetheart of a man, a good man. Uh, one of my best friends, you know, that son of a bitch was a big time college football official. You know, I, uh, actually years before I knew you, I was, uh, having dinner with, uh, my lady friend at the Palm in downtown Nashville. And as I'm walking to my table, as they're taking me to be seated, there sits you and Mark Ratner. Really? And I thought, man, what are the odds of this? I knew Mark. I didn't know Mark. I knew who Mark was through all of my UFC fandom and boxing fandom and all that, but they would refer to him and show him on camera quite a bit. So I was familiar with, man, this is, this guy's a big deal in fighting and there's good old Jr. sans hat. I mean, you weren't looking for a meet and greet, but I know what Jim Ross looks like. (laughs) And and I just thought this is like a celebrity sighting randomly in Nashville. Cause I don't know where either of you live at the time, but I'm thinking, I think Jim's in Oklahoma and I reckon Mark's in Nevada. What the hell yep. are they doing in Nashville? But there you are. Friends are. having dinner, man. Yeah. His friends having dinner. How about that? Yeah. So listen, there's, uh, some other talk of a big man coming in, not just Lennox Lewis. Now there's a fellow named Nathan Jones that Meltzer would say is going to be getting a 10 day look quote. The plan is to have him work two weeks of house shows as well as some dark matches at TV. And at that point they'll decide what to do with him. With the exception of the fact he's already in his mid thirties, he's tailor made for the company's taste as a huge guy with a good body and a decent amount of ch- charisma and at least a strong interview potential since he can speak and he's done acting in Australia. Now here's my favorite line from the observer and boy Meltzer gets it right. Most of the time, maybe not here. The downside is he's very green. And if he's put on a TV show, people will see through him, but he's got far more potential than Batista. Well, maybe not, I don't think so. (laughs) Lord Nathan Jones did have a look. He did have a presence. I could see why people would say, man, we at least got to explore this. What do you remember of meeting Nathan Jones and his work? I was very impressed. Oh, oh, the eyeball test was pretty impressive. Yes. Uh, and he, and he was a pretty, pretty bright guy. Uh, I, he could put sentences together, uh, and, uh, physically he turned heads. But Nathan was, uh, not ready to travel. Uh, we've had other guys there that their social skills didn't correspond to their, uh, their, their look, uh, it was a fait accompli with with Nathan. He was, he was unsteady. He was unstable. I thought a little bit, uh, and that seemed, that seemed to prove it's really true over a short amount of time. Hey, real quick with the NFL now in our rear view mirror. I mean, we know exactly how it all shook out and it felt like one of the great values of the entire year was Brock Purdy, right? I mean, that dude made less than like the starting quarterback at Alabama. Talk about bang for your buck though. I mean, Purdy took them all the way to the Super Bowl. Meanwhile, the Broncos, what they get for their $49 million investment with Russell Wilson this year. Not too much. Well, teams have millions to spend, but when it comes to a great shave, you don't have to shell out a bunch of cash. Harry's saw customers getting ripped off by the shaving industry with overpriced, underperforming products and decided to do something about it. They wanted to do something better. They found their own way to make beautiful designed razors for a fraction of the price of the other big brands. So you never wonder if you overpaid. My man, John Taylor at the office, not only does he, uh, shave his face, he shaves his head and he does it every single day and he does it with Harry's products. As a matter of fact, that's actually the way he describes himself. When we brought up shaving, he said, I'm a Harry's man myself. And what you might not know is Harry's has a whole lot more than just razors. They've got deodorant now and lotion and body wash and hair gel. It's great stuff. I highly recommend it. And I have to admit I was behind. I thought Harry's was just about razors and shave gel. No, it turns out they got everything you're looking for and at an unbeatable value. I want to mention that the German engineered blades are made in their own factory. So they stay sharp longer and they've even got customizable delivery options that allow for scheduled refills as low as just two bucks. And that's about half of what you'd pay for the other big brands. You can get a five blade razor with a weighted handle and foaming shave gel and a travel cover for just three bucks at harrys.com forward slash JR. 
I should also mention that they've got richly lathering skin softening body wash in dude sense. You know what I'm talking about? How about Redwood, Wildlands and Stone? Plus they've got extra strength, high quality, amazing smelling deodorant for just five bucks. They can even help you with your hair and other grooming products all to help you get that unique look that you need. They have the highest customer satisfaction in the entire shaving industry. We think Harry's is like a total no brainer, but if you're on the fence, let me say this, there's a no risk trial. If you don't like your shave, no worries. It's on them. They also have a convenient subscription option that you can cancel anytime. Getting the best doesn't mean spending the most when you shave with Harry's. So get started with a $13 trial set for just three bucks at harrys.com slash JR. That's harrys.com slash JR for a $3 trial set. harrys.com slash JR. Well, we get a little bit of controversy, um, you know, because of all that happened with the Katie Vick thing, it becomes the least watch show since early 1998. The lowest rated live episode of the show in that time period, it was a 3.45 rating total viewers were 4.34 million. So we're just flat and we can have sex and caskets all we want. That's not going to change it. And Vince's reaction to the negativity, according to Dave Meltzer was to get defensive in his posture up strongly. Some saying almost to a scary degree, including an inner office memo to the people in creative midweek saying they're going to continue the course. And it was written in a very smart ass fashion to those who disagreed in the memo McMahon cited that the quarter hour for the angle was the highest rated hour on the show. Of course, that's unbelievably shallow logic because it was guaranteed guaranteed to be the highest segment since the first half was built towards it. People didn't know ahead of time what it was going to be. And even if they did, the car wreck factor would have generated a curiosity look, but the fact that 11% of the viewing audience, which means 565,000 viewers turned the show off after the angle is what should have been looked at. Yeah. An 11% viewership loss is a rare occurrence over a 15 minute period. So Vince having this information. You know, listen, that sometimes people say, oh, numbers don't lie. Well, other people say you can manipulate those numbers to believe how, whatever you want to believe. Yeah. And I understand when he's saying, but it was the highest rated segment, but to Meltzer's point. Yeah. But then they all changed the channel and uh, they didn't come back Conrad. No, they did not. They didn't come back. They were, they were gone for the night. So we lost them all over a half a million viewers. Just read the data. The, the, it's, it's all convenient for a promoter to, uh, or any promoter, not just events. You, you can make, like you said, you can make things the way you want them. Right. But what, what spin are you going to put on it? Yeah, but him saying it's the highest rated quarter hour, he didn't finish the statement. However, we lost 11% of our audience when that segment concluded. Yeah. They left and, in by, and by the way, we don't know where they went because they sure as fuck weren't here. Right. Well, as if this craziness isn't enough, now we've got Stacy Keebler being test manager. We're going to refer to her as his public relations expert. And she's going to say, since Hulk Hogan has Hulkamaniacs and Kane has Kaneites, then he needs to have a term for his fans. So of course, test grabs the mic and says hello to all of his testicles. Boy, our soft, crazy here. our sophomoric well, shit is just at 11. Is it not? Yeah. It's too much. Yeah. It's, it's even if it worked, even if that line got over the testicle line, uh, it's too much or it's being diluted in that regard, in that regard. And that might be a blessing in disguise too. Hell, I don't know, but it's just a, a lousy ass solution to, well, he needs a catchphrase, right? You know, how do, how do my, t- my fans are now called testicles. Well, his name is test. Yeah. There's always a justification as weak as they are. There's always a justification for some of this insanity. Well, and somehow we're still not done. Um, before we get to some more silliness, here's some good stuff. Here's a bright spot. The elimination chamber match is being sold by Eric Bischoff on Monday night. Raw. 
and he describes it as a combination of Survivor Series, the Royal Rumble, and War Games in this new structure that's being built. Of course, here's where we learn it's going to be a six-way elimination match. This really is Survivor Series 02, the creation of the Elimination Chamber. And as somebody who was a big fan of War Games and felt like even though they own the IP, the WWE was never going to use War Games, I was excited about this. What do you remember hearing about the concept before you actually got to see it? Well, I, uh, curiosity, number one, uh, I like the general concept based on what I heard, but I thought when I first heard it, it, it seemed like it took a little bit more, uh, explaining than one would ideally want. It was kind of, uh, convoluted in a certain way. It's hard to explain it. First of all, cause we've never seen one. We had never had one. The structure is brand new. So it had a lot of real positive tra- traits to it, but I needed more knowledge. I needed more education as to what we're doing here. And then once I saw the drawing, what it was going to look like, got more familiar with the uh, rules of engagement. Then, uh, I became more sold on it. I thought it was a nice, I thought it was a, a, a decent, uh, concept. It just it, in the very beginning, it, 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 it may have taken a, a little bit longer to do the explanation than one would ideally want. So you could explain it very simplistically to your audience. They can carry that away with them and make their own decisions. Ultimately, we try to put a, a button on this Kane triple H stuff. They have a casket match. It's a dull match with uh, no heat. The finish would see Shawn Michaels come out of the casket, super kick triple H Kane then choke slams him, throws him in the casket and fans are really excited to see Sean. Then we get to our Halloween Smackdown and there's at least a couple of things here of note. We get John Cena dressed as vanilla ice. And this is the first time as a WWE audience, we don't see him as more of the prototype, but we actually get to see his rapping skills, which we know is going to become a big part of his gimmick moving forward. What'd you think of this, uh, happenstance. I mean, without Halloween, do you think we ever even learn as an audience or an office that Cena can rap? I think so. Conrad, because he did all the time. He entertained people. Okay. So a lot of, a lot, he was, his, uh, work and his skill set in that, in that world, uh, was on display more often than one would think. So we we're all, he was always entertaining. So I, you knew that somewhere along the way, because John liked doing it. It was kind of in vogue that, uh, we hadn't seen the last of the, of the raps. So, but he, and he, and he, by the way, he's really good at it. Yeah. So. Well, with the same episode, this Halloween episode, we see Stephanie looking for her father. She comes around the corner and sees quote unquote, Vince McMahon in this crazy pinstripe suit and a giant Halloween mask of Vince McMahon. And he says that Scott Steiner, this new hot free agent, he's going to be going to Monday night raw, not SmackDown. She wants to know how that is. Bischoff takes the mask off and he plants a big one on Stephanie who at first resists. And then boy, she really gets into it and likes it. (laughs) Now I understand on the surface, this is just creative about feuding general managers. But man, isn't it a little weird that once upon a time, Vince is in the fight of his life for his business. His chief rival is Eric Bischoff. Who's kicking his ass on Monday nights, not every now and again, but 83 times in a row, more than that, but at least 83 times in a row. And then later he's given the opportunity to hire him and have him come work. Come on over pal work for me. By the way, now that you're here, could I get you to make out with my wife and daughter on camera? Cause that'd be great. That feels fucking weird, Jim. Does it not? Yeah. It's, it's so weird. Yeah. It's weird. Strange. That's inside the mind of this man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, be aware of your journey. It's just, again, unless you know him real well, and then it's a crap shoot. Why? Why? I remember that kiss with uh, Eric and Stephanie. Yeah. 
But she, she became a hell of a talent on air, a hell of a talent. I mean, pulling off a kiss like that and making you, and it graduates from some somewhat being forced upon her to her transitioning to where, Hey, I kind of like this. Uh, so, but oh, Bish, uh, that was an interesting booking, you know, Linda and Stephanie, he may be the only guys in wrestling that have ever had that experience. Right. If that means anything, probably not. I think he's the only person I hope, I hope Eric Bischoff's the only person in the world who's made out with Eric and Linda. Cause it'd be really weird if that was not, if he was not the exception of the rule. Be really weird. You said, Eric, you said he's the only person made out with Eric and he, Linda. Well, you know what I mean? Stephanie and Linda. Like <laughs> I hope, I hope to goodness that Eric is the only person who's made out with Stephanie and Linda. Cause that would be weird. Uh, it, it's hard to imagine that in any other context. Like there's no scenario where, you know, now that Vince is retired, not working anymore. I just don't imagine Tony Khan's going to try to bring him into AEW and one of the first pieces of creative be, could you make out with my girlfriend and next week make out with my mom? Like that's just not going to happen. No. I mean, I haven't asked Tony, but I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen. I think you're onto something. So the I'm WWE sure it's not going to happen. No, uh, WWE this past week, uh, announces that they've signed Scott Steiner. Who's 40 years old. So he's on paper, October 22nd. Of course you're helping run talent relations here. What was it like to put this deal together with Scott? It wasn't bad. You know, Scotty had certain demands and he's a uh, headstrong in a lot of ways. Uh, but he's a hell of a talent. So you, you've been here and you, you compromise there and, and, uh, just try to get him uh, a uniform and get him in the game. Uh, cause he had a lot of, he had a lot of credibility, uh, and name identity. You know, when he said Scott Steiner, you knew who you're talking about and he'd been around and, and, and always been in a real good position more often than not. Some may say based on based on what they heard in some of our shows recently that, you know, uh, he, uh, uh, he was just, a, you know, he wasn't himself. He was not a hundred percent healthy, but we felt like it was worth the gamble. And, uh, he, he's another guy that was a hell of an attraction. So, uh, I thought it was a good get for us. I really did. Did you, you know, when you're saying he was headstrong and I mean, do you remember any of the demands Stubborn. he had in particular? Was there anything that was really important to him that you could recall? Oh, same thing. A lot of guys flying first. Once you understand the concept of how you're going to get paid and you get your downside guarantee, let's say your downside guarantee is, uh, a million dollars. That's $1,923 a week. I believe 19,000. Yeah. Yeah. 19,000. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, and, um, so you, you, you cross that bridge that always the flying first class was a big thing to a lot of talents and it was, uh, a big thing to Vince. He protected the first class flyers, uh, opportunity, uh, very aggressively. So, I mean, I've, I've had to go back and resell and repitch something because that's the only piece left. And sometimes that's how I pitched it to him. Look, we got one piece of the puzzle left to make this thing work. Right. You know, and, and, and most of the guys had a good reason. It was not just for the, the cloud of flying on first class, but they're comfort, a big fella. Yeah. The big guys, you know, all these, there's a lot of viable reasons for it. So, uh, I have always appreciated Tony. We have, I don't know how many first class flyers fly for AEW. There are some obviously including myself. But I think that's just good management. And, uh, quite frankly, I probably wouldn't have signed a contract there if I didn't fly first class. Right. It's just too uncomfortable set and coach with that fucking black hat on and see if you don't have a, a perpetual meet and greet. Yeah. So setting up front, you get a little bit more, I don't say is it privacy exclusivity or whatever it may be, but, uh, and that sounds very arrogant. Well, I wouldn't have signed if I didn't get first class. I might have relented on the, if the numbers are right, if the numbers are right, I just, I just upgrade my own tickets, but, uh, it's a, that, the first class was a big thing and I'm sure that it still is to some degree. Well, let's talk about the original plan for survivor series. It's written here that the original plan was Lesnar versus Hogan, but 
Hogan is refusing to put Lesnar over a second time. And they have a meeting where the two leading candidates to put Lesnar over wound up either being big show or Benoit. And Meltzer would say when Vince panics, they go with size. Yep. I would have liked to have seen Hogan Lesnar. Bruce felt like we recently talked about this, that at this point, the audience would not have believed that Hogan was a real threat for Lesnar. I agree. Okay. Bruce is right on that one. I believe. Yeah. You know, you might squeeze up, uh, the old proverbial one off. Right. Uh, uh, but I, I agree with that. It's just that ship had sailed in my view. So, uh, the next week on raw, we get November 4th and you describe it as a uh, more conservative. Batista is now on raw as Dave Batista. He's going to defeat just incredible. Did you feel like he was a, a blue chipper early or is it his, he's somebody you warmed up to and came around on the latter. Yeah. Uh, I, I like Dave a lot and Dave was a popular guy in the locker room area, kind of quiet at times withdrawn. And then he started coming out of his proverbial shell. If that's a good term, I don't know if it is or not. Uh, but his look, mm-hmm. you know, he's six, four, six, five, you know, he looked like a Greek God. Uh, and he, and he was, had a thirst for learning. He wanted to get better. He wanted to be on that level of triple H and Sean and all those cats. So, uh, but I, I always thought he had great unlimited potential. It was just simply a matter. And you can't judge this. You can't predict it. How good can you get? How good will you be in a year? How, how, how hard are you going to push yourself to be different and be better? But I always say he seemed like he always had the work ethic and he wasn't afraid of challenges and, and exploring things. I think that may be one of the reasons that he's such, been such a success almost off the record, off the radar, so to speak, I should say, uh, as in, in movies, you know, he's, he's adapted. He's, you know, he's got, he's a very, I hear he's a very popular guy to work with on, on a movie set. So, uh, so I, I and I like Dave, I like Dave. Tough guy, you know, was he the smoothest? Was he Dory jr? No, but he was a hell of a hand and, uh, he got better and better. That's the great thing about it is that before he completely burned out, he got to be a, a pretty damn good wrestler. No doubt about it. Uh, he's going to go on to, uh, to become quite the, the, the sports entertainer. We're given an opportunity to Trish and Victoria here. Uh, it's announced that they're going to have a hardcore match for survivor series. So Victoria is playing like a psycho movie character and, uh, listen, here's the reality. No matter what you think of this creative, it is a departure up until this point. The ladies had primarily only been on pay-per-view in some sort of a Braun panties type match. So this is at least a step in the right direction and who better than Victoria and, uh, Trish, right? Yeah, they had good chemistry. Uh, they both were willing to help each other. Good, good, sim, good uh, continuity in that respect. Uh, Victoria came and wrote, Victoria's probably one of the more underrated off the radar hands. She's big and fit, big. I don't say it's hard to, you gotta be careful what you, how you say this as far as female athletes, she was strong. She had a, she had a great stature, uh, and just, and she worked her ass off so hard and that's a lot. She's done. She did some great things coming from where she was. As one of Godfather's hoes, right, to becoming a champion. <clears throat> so uh, I always admired that for her work ethic. But she and Trish had good chemistry, and unlike some of the guys at times, they seemed to be on the same page regarding selling, being, you know, uh, sharing the ring, sharing s- spotlight, and that type of thing. So it was, it was a, a good chemistry for them and. And I'm glad that they got that shot. It led to a lot of things for women in uh, WWE and beyond. So Jim, before we get back into uh, survivor series, cause we're almost there. I want to talk about a couple more pieces of news and notes. Uh, Randy Orton is going to barge in on some of the programming here with the RNN update. It's a funny concept, but it does eventually feel like we're kind of out of things for him to talk about. I appreciate that. Looking back at this 20 years ago, we get to see these stars in various states of their career growth. You know, we see Cena rapping for the first time. 
We're seeing Batista not wrestling as Deacon Batista, but wrestling as Dave Batista for the first time. Okay. And Randy Orton, the RNN news update, we're trying to show different sides of his personality. Did you think that was the right fit for him? Or is it just one of those things where when you got a new guy, you just got to try some things? Well, it didn't click to me. Yeah. Which means nothing other than this. Personally, I didn't think it was the, the best thing we could have done for Randy, but it, it was uh, worth a try because it, if it had gotten over, then I'd be singing a different song here right now, but I, I didn't think it fit Randy real well. It was a, it was a failed attempt to find something for him to do that was positive and productive. I don't think that was the answer. What is positive and productive is Mysterio and edge beating angle and Benoit to win the tag titles on SmackDown. They go nearly 25 minutes and folks really loved it. This is where we start to see the SmackDown six form over on SmackDown, uh, Ray and edge angle, Benoit, the Guerrero's just some really good wrestling contrast that to some of the silly storytelling we've got over on Monday night raw. And you would even take to the Ross report and say that Ross trying to find the correct balance between steak and sizzle. Which, if you understand JR speak, means we got a lot of horse shit over there, but hang tight. We're working on it. <laughs> well, uh, that's pretty close to now. I'd say that's accurate. Yeah. Uh, you would also know in your Ross report that our old pal Gerald Briscoe is headed down to the Kurt Angle Classic, and he's going to be tagging along with Angle and Brock Lesnar, trying to scout some new talent. Uh, it's also noted in your report that Terry Taylor is now an agent for Raw, working with a lot of the talent uh, before the show starts, along with Arn Anderson. And you report that WWE's hired Rip Rogers as a coach to start working down in OVW. I think everybody listening to this is pretty familiar with Terry Taylor and Arn Anderson, but maybe some of our listeners aren't too familiar with Rip Rogers. What can you tell us about Rip and why was he the right guy to join up for OVW here? Well, when you talk about trainers, you know, uh, one name pops in my head first, that's Tom Pritchard, uh, who was a hell of a trainer, uh, Dory jr was a hell of a trainer, but Riff Rogers is a little different animal. You know, he, he came from, uh, he worked in territories back in the day. Uh, but he is so fundamentally sound. I'd put him in one of the top two or three spots on my personal list of, uh, of guys that train wrestlers, even to this day. Uh, if you get under his learning tree, if you're a wrestler, you want to be a wrestler, uh, you'll be making a good move. So he was very, uh, underrated maybe, but boy, he did a great job for us, uh, teaching guys, the basic fundamentals with no bullshit, no nonsense, uh, and, uh, just a hard working guy. So he's, uh, he's got his, he's made his mark. He's got his niche now in, in the, in the wrestling business. And that being one of the top trainers in the world. Well, we also got some news and notes over on SmackDown. It looks like Heyman and Lesnar are going to be splitting up here. We're advancing that storyline, but in a very real circumstance, Saturn is officially released and Meltzer would say it was no surprise. And apparently the decision was made while he was injured that they weren't going to bring him back. He would say the nature of his contract, which expires in January is that he's getting paid in full through January, but apparently paying a big lump sum for the release now which maybe gets the contract off the books quicker. We talked to Bruce years ago about when the radicals first jumped ship from WCW to the WWE. And he saw, of course, everybody believed there was a huge upside in Benoit. And he thought that Eddie Guerrero might could be the Hispanic Shawn Michaels, but Bruce specifically thought, man, Perry Saturn is a big dude with a great look. There's a lot of upside on our side of the fence for that guy. And it never really clicked. I mean, listen, he had some good matches and he made some chicken salad with things like moppy, but it never really got any momentum. Why do you think that was, was Vince, did Vince just not get it with, with, uh, Perry? I don't think he did. I don't think Vince did. I think, uh, I think Perry was, uh, couldn't get out of the shadow of Benoit and Eddie. Right. And, uh, so by comparison. Uh, there is no comparison, uh, you know, so, but Perry was easy to work, pretty easy to work with. You know, we, you still got to deal with all the external, external things, Conrad, uh, you know, drug and alcohol abuse, uh, pain pills, all this shit. She just never goes away seemingly. 
I don't think it's quite as drastic today by any means as it was in that era. So, uh, and, and of course the talents will always have their excuse and some of them are just not excuses. They're reasons. You know, I got a bad back. I can't make my bookings. The same thing would go back to that first class airfare. You know, I, I, I upgraded Sean Waltman. Yeah. His agent was Barry Bloom. Who's my agent now in Jericho's and Kenny Omega. And Everybody's Barry's yeah. Yeah. He's got and Mick. Uh, so, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, Perry just, it, he just barely missed. He just barely missed. And I don't never, I never did understand why Vince didn't have the confidence in Perry that others did seemingly. And it's just that it just didn't click. It just didn't, it didn't work. And that's unfortunate. Perry was a good guy. He's solid hand. No doubt about that. Well, let's talk about the show. Uh, here it is Madison square garden. It's still the garden. It's still special. And it's a critical success with the observer readers. 76.2% thumbs up. Uh, but as a reminder, the prior year survivor series was the final match between the, the whole invasion angle. So it's the the Alliance of WCW and ECW taking on the WWF for brand supremacy. So that did 450,000 buys, which you could argue should have been a lot higher than that, but boy, the invasion storyline was just bungled. But by this point, man, in 02, the WWE's reeling a little bit. This show, instead of doing 450,000, like it did no one, did 340,000 buys. So we've managed to turn off over a hundred thousand paying customers in t- inside of 12 months. And it's not like we could say, well, the invasion angle was great creative. We all recognize it was less than, but it was still 110,000 higher than this. Is this the ever dreaded cyclical line that we like to say, or is it more than that? Are fans this turned off by things like Katie Vick and hot lesbian yeah. action, et cetera, et cetera. I think they, your ladder, I think, uh, we didn't have a lot of, we weren't building a lot of momentum, at least momentum in a positive way. If that makes any sense whatsoever, uh, it, it just bad creative gave the fans no big, strong reason it were to make it. Can't miss television. You know, the, during the attitude era, Monday night raw is can't miss TV. Everybody watched. Yeah. And now, uh, this scenario is a little bit different, but it's, if you just do the math, you can tell that. We were not the basic fundamental thing of promotion. We were not providing the fans with what they wanted to see. And that's why all those folks did come back to buy this pay-per-view. They did. They were, some of them are probably disgusted. Some were probably disillusioned. Yeah. But nobody was flocking to this creative and saying, man, I got to watch this again. This is going to be great. Can't wait till next week. I don't think that was happening that often. Well, it is a legitimate sellout. There's 17,930 fans there. About 15,500 of them were paying fans. And it broke the all time gate record for pro wrestling in New York City $1,250,580. It's the largest live gate for any pro wrestling show ever in North, Al- North America that wasn't North Alabama. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't a WrestleMania. Think about that. Largest gate. In North American history for a non WrestleMania. So listen, we can poke holes and say, oh, they're down on pay-per-view and blah, blah, blah. But there's other metrics that you would measure your business. And man, if we're sold out at the garden and setting records, like not just for this building, not just for this market, but for North of freaking America, or as I said, Alabama, that's pretty strong, dude. Yeah, it is. And, uh, uh, it's like putting a bandaid on a wound that house took a lot of the heat off yeah, for, for a lot of folks and, uh, gave a little bit of a surcease as Gordon Stoll used to say, uh, uh-uh. uh, huh. uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, it was a, it was a temporary feel good. It's like having taken medicine. It's going to work for a while, but then now what? And we need a new band aid. So that's kind of how I looked at that thing. It was a great success. It was cool as hell to see the garden packed. 
it's, it, and to know that most of the tickets were actually sold and not given away. Yes. Uh, I thought that was kind of good. And so, but it was just, it was a, it was a temporary fix. The euphoria that that success created was much needed to say the least. Let's uh, read the uh, description of the show here directly from uh, the observer. The WWE changed five championships, including the big two and debuted the most expensive structure in wrestling history to, da- uh, to headline the survivor series on November 17th from New York's Madison square garden. I find that listen, there's a lot more written about the show and we're going to get into the whole show, but I, I sometimes forget how monumental a show like this is. Five title changes, including both world titles. And I guess I never really thought about it, but he's dead on the most expensive structure in wrestling history. I know you don't have this in front of you, but I am just going to ask hypothetically, what do you think this thing costs the company to build it? Yeah. Oh gosh, Connie. I don't really know. I just been making a, a wild guess. I would say probably it was, uh, quarter of a million dollars. Wow. And I'm, and that, look, that's a guess. So when somebody yeah. steals our shit here today yeah. for their own websites, right. Right. They're, they're going to say that JR said that the hell, the elimination chamber costs a quarter of a million dollars to build. I didn't say that. So everybody knows, uh, I, I I'm just, I'm giving you a, you asked me a question. Yes. I don't know the exact answer, but I was guessing about a quarter of a million dollars. You got to hang it. You gotta, you gotta, it's gotta be steady. It's a whole new structure. There's not a, not a template for it. So I, that's just a wild ass guess on my part. Well, it's a good wild ass guess. We like wild ass guesses. <laughs> uh, let's get into the show here. I'm pretty pumped to talk about this one. I guess we should mention first, there is a, a pre-show match. If you will, it's Lance storm and William Regal taking on gold dust and hurricane. It was supposed to be on the pay-per-view. Now it's on heat. Meltzer would say that's a last minute call. Uh, he called it a typical heat match that was fine, but I had no time to really mean anything. Cause they only get three minutes in one second. And then Tommy dreamer runs in and cleans house with cane shots to a big pop. And that does raise the question to me in your opinion, could the WWE have done more with Tommy dreamer? I mean, for him to get a pop in Madison square garden like that, that's pretty cool. I was very cool. Yeah. I, I think. Tommy's another guy that's kind of underrated at times. He's been painted that ECW brush so fervently yeah. that sometimes people can't see past that. Tommy's a very intelligent, very sound, very solid pro wrestler who loves the business about as much as anybody I've ever, ever, ever met. So, uh, but again, that sometimes the ECW brush doesn't paint all pretty pick, pretty colors. And I think that's the deal. I think Tommy was looked at as being as tired and it's been around and blah, blah, blah. I didn't see it that way. Uh, he, he, you want guys like Tommy dreamer to help the young guys understand what they should and should not be doing. And the way you get that more often than not, obviously is to have the, have uh, Tommy work, work with younger guys and, and see how you can help them. So, uh, Tommy is a underrated gym in this whole, uh, in the, in that era, he, he could have done a lot more and you never would have been embarrassed. He would always worked his ass off. He would have done what he was asked to do. He's a true pro. Here we go. Let's start the show, man. It's Jeff Hardy and Bubba Ray and Spike Dudley and a six man taking on Rosie Jamal and Rico. It's a tables elimination match with lots of high risk spots. Uh, the, the finish is going to happen where Devon returns to being a Dudley complete with the Dudley Ware, of course he was brother Devon before, and he was a pastor and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, we're excited here in New York city to see our, our Dudleys back together again. So, uh, the Dudley side is the a side. They go 14 minutes and 22 seconds and Meltzer thought it was uh, pretty fun. He gave it three stars. Uh, Rico is going to wind up with several cuts on his arm from his biceps to his forearms from particles of the breaking tables. But anytime you do some sort of a, a table match with the Dudleys in MSG, fans are going to get with it. And this is a heck of a way to start the show. Yeah. Great way. It got audio, the audience invested early in the building. Right. 
it set the precedent for the excitement level, if you will, uh, and, and so to speak. So, uh, yeah, the Dudleys are, and, and look, Dudleys and Jeff Hardy, that's a pretty damn powerful six man team. Uh, a lot of popularity, a lot of name identity, as we mentioned earlier on some other, somebody else. Uh, but the Jeff Hardy was getting over and the Dudleys were huge in that area, that part of the world, uh, especially not just that part of the world, but especially in that part of the world. And I know it was going to be a thrill for those guys to, to work on a pay-per-view from the garden. They grew up going to the garden. That's a big deal. Right. You know, so, uh, I, I, uh, but I, they never felt in my memory, the Dudleys never failed to deliver when booked in a spot where they were really needed to deliver. And these first matches on these pay-per-views are important fall under the category of it really needs to deliver and set the tone. Yeah. Talk to me about the Dudleys together or separate. You know, I, um, I love the Dudley boys. One of my all time favorites, a guilty pleasure, if you will, uh, I enjoy their stuff, but when we split them up here, it felt like we didn't really know what we were doing with Bubba and boy, poor Devon with this reverend gimmick. This was just not good. We know that Bubba would have great success as a single as bully Ray and TNA. And maybe we were just trying that here in O2, but them together, I don't know. Like I understand we split the rockers and, and one became a star and well, one didn't. And maybe we split the heart foundation with similar results, but I just prefer the Dudleys together. Is, is that just something that's common with tag teams or was it just the environment they were in here that didn't allow them to flourish as singles? I, I just think fans enjoyed their, the tandem. Uh, and they had good, great, uh, chemistry. They had, uh, they were, they were almost uh, seamless. They'd worked together so much and so long that they didn't have any missteps. It was obvious to anybody, or at least to most people, it certainly was obvious to me. The star of the duo was Bubba. It's just a matter that, you know, you, there's, there's going to be a certain uh, level of, uh, separation anxiety when a longtime team that had, had earned a lot of popularity now. Uh, it's going to be split apart. And then how do you create an identity that would merit his ability for, for Bubba? Bubba was a star of that show and he, and, uh, to me, he always will be. So, uh, you know, I, Bubba's he's outspoken, you know, we've had some spirited, uh, debates. Usually over cash or creative. Imagine right. that Connie. Imagine that. Yeah. Imagine that. So, uh, but he's a smart guy and you can tell sometimes, uh, exactly how smart he is when you hear his, some of his, uh, uh, renderings on uh, busted open uh, that he's on a few days a week. So, uh, but Bubba brought a lot to the table. I think if Bubba was easier to get along with, and I might, I might be sticking out of school and I'm not trying to offend him or anybody else. If Bubba was just a little bit easier to uh, get along with, and I think in his older age, he's becoming more. I don't say more mellow, but more willing to compromise and listen. Uh, you know, Bubba should be helping somebody in a big way with a re in a wrestling company. He's, he's got a great mind for it. So, uh, he's the kind of guy that, uh, years ago, Connie, that, uh, con that cowboy bill Watts would have hired to come to the territory and would have helped bill book. And he would have booked his, certainly booked his own program. And I, Watts had a way of doing that with guys. That, you know, when you get a talent that buys into this, to the creative that they help create, they are, are valuable as hell. And I think Bubba would have been a valuable as hell work for Cowboy at that point in time. Uh, and he's still valuable. You know, he's, he still goes out there and, and he's smart by the bookings he chooses. So Bubba was the guy in that whole quadre of talents that I thought had the biggest upside. Now that's of the far as the Dudleys are concerned. Jeff Hardy was on another level too, but Jeff Hardy was the one that was chosen to seem to be the guy over his brother, Matt. Jeff had the most charisma and most uniqueness or whatever. So it's just, it's just funny. You, you, it's like being in a marriage, Connie. It's like, uh, you know, how do you rebound from your separation? How do you rebound from your divorce? Uh, how, how, what does the future look like? Blah, blah, blah. And. I, I, I liked the, what those guys did a lot, physical, reliable, good stuff.
that was, that was a hell of a way to start the show. I, was, I know we're spending too much time probably on the six man, but it really set the stage and was more important. I think uh, to talk about that a little bit more than I had originally planned. And with that in mind, let's get to the second match here. J Billy Kidman is going to win the cruiserweight title from Jamie Noble in seven minutes and 29 seconds. Meltzer would say it was good work marred by a dead crowd until the last 90 seconds. Now let's just time out right there. Nydia and, and Jamie Noble are one hell of a package. I love their presentation. I think in this, in this era, he's one of the most underrated wrestlers. Billy Kidman had been good at this point for 10 years. Phenomenal in-ring performers really love their stuff, but even if you're working a cruiserweight style, following a six man, that's explosive with a big emotional return, like Devon and all these tables, man, that's hard to fit. That's hard to freaking follow. Is it not? Yeah. It's hard to follow. Yeah. But uh, you know, they, they, they're just, they don't have to follow it and blow it away. Just do your thing as so be solid and, uh, that's, that's your job. Your job. Now your job is to move, to move the runners around the base. Your job is to move the thing along a little bit. Just don't let it, don't, don't, don't let your work in this match sink the momentum that your six man just built. This is a fun match. Noble's going to do a sick DDT off the ropes where Kidman almost goes down vertically. This move wakes the crowd up and then they start building for the finish. Kidman hits that shooting star press for the pin. It's a fun match. Uh, it's about as fun of a match as you can have in seven minutes and 29 seconds. Yep. And it keeps us going to the next match, which is Victoria, uh, taking on, uh, Trish. She's going to win a hardcore title match here. And now she's the women's champion and they're trying some new things here, doing some, what Meltzer would call single white female esque storyline stuff, but we've got garbage can lid shots. Uh, Meltzer would even say Victoria's creating a new MMA submission, submission maneuver called the broomstick choke. So we're trying lots of new stuff. We're using the steps. Uh, I'm not going to say that it's, uh, the best hardcore match we ever saw, but considering we normally see bra and panty matches to see yep. them using garbage cans and the steps and fire extinguishers, it's pretty cool. And I think it's better than Meltzer did. He only gave it a star and a quarter. But for the advancement of women's wrestling, this was a, a step in the right direction. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I thought they had a great presentation. Uh, I, I really respect and love both those ladies. They are always good. They're reliable. Uh, if they're booked somewhere for an appearance or if they're booked in a match like this in a high level, they delivered. Uh, so, and like I said, uh, you know, Victoria coming, uh, from being one of God, just being a, a walk on character. Just a background player, uh, as one of the Godfather's hoes, and where she ended up is uh, pretty impressive to me. Of course, Trish is one of those once in a generation talents, right? Male or female, she's got it. And I, I thought the world show you how much Trish loves the business. I mean, she she came from Toronto to Waterloo, Iowa, for the Dan Gable Luthes. Yeah banquet yeah. this year when she didn't have to, she was invited, but that doesn't mean you got to go, but that just shows her dedication to the business and her appreciation for being honored and recognized. So she's always going to be one of my favorites. The next match is uh, one we're going to have to debate and discuss as a reminder at this point, Brock Lesnar is undefeated. One of the original ideas here was Brock Lesnar versus Hulk Hogan. Hogan was down for it, but felt like since he had already lost to Lesnar, well, he needed to win. Yeah. See there. Really? Lesnar. You shitting me. You're a fucking Hulk Hogan. You're over. You'll be over to for eternity and beyond. And in a, in a three or four days, a normal dude is going to forget. Really? It's not going to become a big issue whatsoever about who won and who lost, especially who lost. You embellish the winner and all that good stuff. But, uh, I, uh, I, I don't know. I never, I never had a good feeling about that, that pairing. And, uh, I might've been a blessing in disguise that the match didn't happen. Well, instead, as we all recall, Vince tells Hulk, I'm not ready to beat Brock yet. Sorry, pal. 
So they go with big show and big show beats Brock in four minutes and 19 seconds. So this is Brock Lesnar's first loss. It happens just a shade over four minutes in Lesnar is going to use a belly to belly overhead and the MSG crowd, which was already behind Lesnar pops big for it. Then he does an F five and a second referee runs down. Heyman pulls him out of the ring, decks the referee. Now remind you. Heyman is still managing Brock Lesnar. So this is Heyman turning on Brock Lesnar show now comes from behind with a chair to the ribs and a chair to the back. Here's a choke slam on the chair and here's the pin one, two, three Meltzer says in the latest copy of the 1997 survivor series show and Heyman ran out of the building into an awaiting getaway car, two stars. So we're at the five-year anniversary, if you will of the Montreal screw job here in 2002. And we're going to screw Brock Lesnar out of the title. We're going to do it as the fourth match on the show. We're going to split up Heyman and Brock Lesnar. We're going to hand Brock his first loss in four minutes and 19 seconds. And we're going to do it to a guy who the company gave up on at this point years ago. I love me some big show. How can you overstate the size and, and his importance to the company? But man, it was like, he's a baby face this week and next week he's a heel. And we just go back and forth. It's interesting to sort of peer into the mind of Vince McMahon who tells Hulk Hogan, not ready to beat Brock yet. Our oh, big show can beat him in four minutes. That's crazy to me. It is crazy. Yeah. It's illogical. Yeah. Uh, why do we need to change the championship? Right. And, uh, I would never book that match. The match would never have happened if right. I was, if, if I had the old proverbial pencil which has the most powerful weapon in all of wrestling on one end, the eraser. We never booked it again, protect your attraction. The seven foot, 500 pound, 400 pound, whatever guys come up, they'll come along that often. He's an attraction that can't be replaced as far as look and perception and size. So, uh, crazy. Don't book that match, book another match that Brock can go out and have an athletic contest with. You notice that there's, they kept this match short because they didn't want to overexpose either guy and to have a title match, it goes four minutes and one of your biggest stars, that's going to be the, one of the biggest stars in the history of your company gets beat in four minutes. I don't know what we accomplished. I really don't. Next up. It's uh, one heck of a tag match. The Los Guerreros are going to win the SmackDown tag titles in a three way over Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit and Rey Mysterio and Edge. Meltzer says this match was actually a disappointment, although it would have been considered really good if anyone else had the match. And maybe there's something to that. The expectations were so high because, as we said, these guys are being referred to as the SmackDown 6, and they're just turning them loose here for nearly 20 minutes. It gets three and a half stars. Ultimately, Eddie's going to put Mysterio in the lasso from El Paso, and that's the clean submission. But man, think about what's to come for these guys. Reminder, we got Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit in the same ring on a pay-per-view in Madison square garden, just a, a, a ring full of hall of famers. There's no way these guys could have a bad match. No, I agree. I agree. And that's why we signed them. We knew what we were going to get no matter who else is on the card, no matter what position they are on the card, they're going to deliver. And as competitive as those two guys were, uh, you knew they were going to deliver in a big way. Uh, both of them are looking for act, the recognition. You better acknowledge Conrad. You better acknowledge. And that's, that's what I always believe that those guys are looking for acknowledgement from the fans and their peers that because we're five, eight or five, nine, whatever it may be, we can still outwork you and we can outdraw you. Because our performances are going to be the best. There's a, uh, a segment here in the match that kind of hurts it. Chavo throws the belt to angle who catches it. When Benoit turns around, he sees the belt in angles hands. They're arguing that leads to a spear finish. And then Benoit and angle argue all the way to the back. And Meltzer would say the crowd reaction here was a surprise and it really hurt the match. The crowd booed seemingly a combination of guys, not liking edge and fans mad that Benoit and angle particularly angle was out of the match. I love this New York crowd and boy, we're going to give them what they want here. Chris Nowinski is going to come out and say people in New York are stupid. 
Matt Hardy's going to come out, start to tease that he's going to defend New York, but he says, they're not stupid. They're losers. And, uh, of course here comes Scott Steiner to what Meltzer called an enormous pop. And he corrects himself and says, in fact, enormous probably doesn't even do it justice. When Steiner's out here, he's going to press Matt overhead, nearly lose him, but manage to regain control, throw him over the top rope where he wipes out Nowinski. And then he's supposed to cut a promo, but there's no mic there. So we hear an F bomb on the show from Scott Steiner in his debut, but man, they are reacting to big pop a pump in a big way. And as a guy who just had to maybe acquiesce to some of his demands, you probably felt like, all right, maybe it was worth it hearing that pop, huh? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah you, uh, we, you never know exactly how uh, a returning talent or a new talent, whatever term you want to use, uh, is going to be received. Our questions are answered very quickly regarding Scott Steiner. And, uh, yeah, it was, I was happy to hear that, that pop that's you're happy to hear any pop, but on, on, a, on a new guy coming back, it sort of validates your negotiation and, uh, and getting a guy on paper. So that was, that was really important. I used to stress to the guys, let's don't talk. To, I don't want you talking to the talents I'm negotiating with. I don't use it because they're going to ask you about creative, right? Cause they care about cash and creative. I'm going to be, I'm going to take care of their cash issues. Creative, I'm not because I don't have any say in that. Right. And, and it, quite frankly, what they hear regarding potential future creative can adversely affect negotiations. What if they don't hear what they want to hear? What if you don't have a valid answer for it? So, you know, the question is Scott, he was, you know, he, as you, that F bomb was just indicative of his competitiveness. And, uh, you know, he, he didn't give a shit. And I'm not saying that in a negative way. He just, he, he just didn't. And, uh, I kind of like that trade in him. Of course, I've been a Steiner guy since the Cowboy Bill Watts day. So I'm, I'm biased. And I, I was still disappointed that we didn't get the full run out of the Steiners versus uh, doc and Gordy. I thought that was, uh, that left some meat on the bone, quite frankly. And we're excited to announce a new affiliate partnership with fanatic fanatics. Easy for me to say the world's largest collection of officially licensed fan gear. It's an easy way to support your favorite podcasts, shop for your favorite players and teams by going to shop sportsmerch.com. That's shop sportsmerch.com. Or if you're watching along with us on YouTube, just hit that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or just check out the uh, description below for the link. We'll also have it up on all of our socials. You can shop with confidence for your favorite jerseys, caps, shirts, jackets, hoodies, and more with fanatics, but be sure to use our special link shopsportsmerch.com, and that will support our show. Next up, it's our main event. Shawn Michaels is going to win the raw title in the elimination chamber. The very first one, he beats triple H. He beats Rob Van Dam. He beats Chris Jericho he beats Kane and Booker T they go 39 minutes and 20 seconds. And, uh, maybe the most notable thing beyond it is just a dangerous structure is Rob Van Dam climbs to the top of one of the chambers and comes across with a frog splash on triple H that hurts him. And I, I believe it was like a knee on the throat. And, uh, Meltzer would say at one point, the match wasn't very good. Then Michael's juiced and he starts taking a bunch of bumps on his back on the steel, which maybe considering his back history, wasn't the best call. Eventually we get down to triple H hitting a pedigree, but everybody's too stunned to roll over for the pin. There's another pedigree attempt. Michaels blocks it, hits the super kick and that's it. Huge confetti celebration and it's everywhere. Meltzer would call it a real strong visual to end the show. And he says that Michaels physically had lost some of his wrestling timing, which was one of his strong suits. And he maybe looked a little smaller here. That may be splitting hairs, Conrad, just between you and me. But he says that his timing, as far as when to do spots and how to do them for the most impact is still impeccable. Bingo. And that's what made the last part of the match. So strong. He gave it four and a quarter stars, and it is a hell of a debut for the elimination chamber. And I know that somebody out there is going to probably argue this, but in my opinion, 
This was the very best elimination chamber. We didn't know what to expect. It was new. It was exciting. It was a real moment to see Shawn Michaels, not only back, but back as a champion here in the company. I loved it. I thought it was a really special way to end the show and just the visual of the confetti. It made it feel yep. big. Shawn Michaels at this point, by the way, is just 37 years old. Um, after the he match, got rid of those, he got real those, those brown tights though. Right. I, I don't think they ever came back <laughs> that, that haircut. I said, I asked him, I remember I asked him, I said, what's the story in this haircut? I said, uh, did you lose a bet? <laughs> little Dutch boy haircut is what we call oh, it here yeah. in Alabama. Yeah. Uh, triple H wrestles nearly 40 minutes and the last 27 of them are with a pretty serious throat injury. So serious that after the match, he goes to the hospital by ambulance. They hold him overnight for observation and testing. And, uh, they're telling him he shouldn't wrestle until the week before Thanksgiving at the absolute earliest he's diagnosed with just a swollen neck but it's making breathing and talking very difficult by putting pressure on his esophagus and trachea. Listen, Van Dam's trying things. It's not like he can do the move the way he normally would inside this structure. He's doing it from an awkward position. I guess the natural question is there's a lot of conspiracy theorists who believe that triple H was uh, a political animal. Is there any heat on Rob Van Dam for this? Or does everybody understand? It was a freaking accident in a new structure. I think most people thought the latter. I think yeah. most people thought that it was a, it was a brand new deal. And yeah. And, uh, I don't see as Rob being a culprit. He, you know, the only thing you say is that, well, the, the agent that put the help, put the match together should have made sure that, uh, you didn't try something that you had been doing, but you'd never done it in the, in the structure before it just didn't fit well. And maybe that's the case here with this, uh, this situation of triple H because RVD was, and he was stiff and snug, maybe a better word. I don't know, but I don't ever remember him being overly dangerous, quite frankly. So, but it was a, it, it could have been a big conspiracy theory, quite frankly. And I'm sure some RVD loyalists that are enjoying their 420, uh, would might disagree with us, but so be it. Well, the, uh, the structure itself, Meltzer believed cost around $500,000 to build. Now, I don't know if, if that is a quote unquote working number, but you know, we can all agree it's a six figure structure. There's pressure on the talent to get over the, the, the dangerousness of this and, and just how violent it is. And I remember watching as a fan thinking, man, I don't know how they're going to take bumps all over that metal. Yeah. And they did. Um, there's criticism in the observer saying some view this as a questionable expense because that's like what they spend almost for developmental in a year. And we're spending this on one quote unquote gimmick match at a time when the company's making a lot of cutbacks, but I view it a different way as, Hey man, they're trying to create new tent pole events and clearly it worked. We set an all time North American record. So much like we have a, a, a really successful Royal rumble concept survivor series by this point, boy, the five on five thing that was passe. Nobody cared about it anymore. No, so if you they can, still if, don't, but by the way, they still don't, they still don't. What would you say to the, the folks who may have been critical of the expense behind the structure? Uh, get over it. Yeah. Let's, we got to try new things. Uh, you hit the nail on the head. It, it, if it had gotten over to the level that was envisioned or hoped for, uh, it would have been a tent pole event. The whole uh, paper would, would have been built around the elimination chamber main event. That was always going to be the goal. New pay-per-view titles were, were needed. And this was a very, you know, I, 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 I had no, I had no problem with that thing. Like I said to you earlier, I was confused a little bit when it was first introduced to me and before I saw the, the artist drawing, so I get a visual of what they're, I was being, uh, told, but and all that, that's all that was. Hey, if it had hit the way that everybody wanted and it created a brand new title where it became an annual event, 
that was very much anticipated, uh, then nobody would be talking like this. Let's just remind everybody Hogan's gone. Austin's gone. Rock is gone. And we're trying to build new stars, but we've essentially killed Kane with this Katie Vick stuff. And we're trying to just create stars at this point. And instead of going with a Rob Van Dam or a Booker T or someone else, we go with Shawn Michaels and Meltzer wonders what type of message does that send the boys when you're switching both of your big titles on the same night, it's a lot to process creatively as a fan. And he even says, and these are his words show considered the laziest wrestler on the roster, got the title on one side. On the other side, which desperately needs to make a new top star, they put the title on someone who isn't doing house shows and is in for just a short-term nostalgia fix, who from ratings and crowd reactions, whose latest return was a disappointment as far as connecting with anyone but the older fans. So we push Brock Lesnar all year and we change the course and go with a guy who Maybe the WWE wasn't really high on once upon a time and it takes four minutes. And now instead of making a new star with this new structure, we're going back to old nostalgia. And so a lot of folks believe that something's changed with Vince. Here's the report from uh, Dave Meltzer. The big thing that is privately being said by people who are closest to McMahon is that things have changed greatly. Even of late people who've been the most loyal to him and praised him for decades have become more frustrated at the lack of long-term decision-making whether McMahon has lost confidence in himself. The internal feeling is that McMahon makes all decisions based on the last person who has his ear at the last moment, pushing their beliefs. And in many cases, their personal agendas. So let's talk about that. You had been with the company for a long time at this point. Did you feel, did you ever remember feeling a shift in you know, Vince used to have more vision long-term for these sort of things. And it does feel more willy nilly. Like who talked to him last? Is that, is that fair to, is Meltzer got the right line of thinking there? And is this around the time that changed or is that all just much ado about nothing? It's not much to do about nothing because of the, of, of the, what we've seen and, and this, what's this, how things played out. Um, uh, I. It, it, it showed me that Vince was going to emphasize to spend more time on the entertainment side of sports entertainment than the sports side. The, the roster that I recruited signed were recruited because of the sports side. Cause you can't say, well, I saw this guy in an independent match. Or I saw this guy in an old match from EC dub or whatever it may be. And, and I know that they're going to be a great personality. My first priority was, are you reliable? Can you work? Are you willing to be a team player? Meaning that when you're asked to put somebody over, you do it in the most magnanimous and most effective way humanly possible. And, uh, some talents still don't get that this very day. They don't understand that the, the, the total of the match is much more important than the, the final three seconds, the total of the match. I, I hate to, to do a sh like we, what we do here, Connie, where we'd say, uh, well, uh, it was, the finish was interesting, but the match itself was not very good. I don't think that's a good thing. Right. I just don't think it's a good thing. So, but you know, Hey, Vince, Vince is getting older. He's still got a lot of on his plate being, uh, the head honcho of a publicly traded company, uh, his lifestyle, whatever it may be, you can tell that there was some changes ongoing and it was, it was, uh, distracting quite frankly. Hey, in my real life, man, I'm helping people save money. I'd be glad to help you too. If you're looking to buy a house, if you're looking to get out of that apartment, if you're looking to sell your house, if you're looking to fix your credit uh, so you can buy a house, if you're looking to get some pro tips on how to save money to buy a house or how much you need to buy a house, or maybe you're just trying to save some money on your current bills, maybe get rid of some credit card debt, maybe consolidate a car payment. Maybe you just need some cash to do some remodels around the house. Whatever it is, we can help you at savewithconrad.com. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket. But man, if we can't help you save some cash, we won't waste your time. But you can get a quick quote, even talk to a live person right now at savewithconrad.com 
or give us a call toll free 888-425-0105. By all means, give us a buzz. Ask for me We're right here on the parkway in Huntsville, Alabama, but licensed pretty much all over the country and able to help you remotely. Uh, seriously, think of me next time you need something in that area. You got a friend in the business. You can also just drop me an email, Conrad at savewithconrad.com. If I can be helpful, I'd love to do that. I'd love to let my family help your family. And don't just take my word for it. Go check us out. We got an A plus with the BBB. And you can read all of our five star reviews. There's more than a thousand of them at conradreviews.com. Uh, but savewithconrad.com, that's your hookup, man. I love the show. I, uh, I thought it was a fun show. I understand the long-term criticisms and, and, and the armchair quarterbacking. Uh, but when you're able to just watch the show for what it is, this was a good show to me. Uh, Instagram, a wrestling historian wants to know any idea why there were no traditional team elimination matches this year. Did they those... stopped working. Yeah. Nobody gave a shit, uh, to be polite to you. Uh, it, it, that that's again, that creative ship had sailed and it sailed so far away. We couldn't even see it anymore. It sunk. The poster for this event has Rob Van Dam on it, which brings coach Rosie to wonder why didn't Rob Van Dam get his push during this time? WWE was promoting the heck out of Rob Van Dam. He's even on the poster. Keep doing what you're doing. JR. We love you. So thanks for those well wishes, Josh, but. You know, he did have a, a show stealing match back at invasion in July of 01. And you could argue that, you know, he continued to gain in popularity. Could this have been hindsight being what it is an opportunity to, cause we saw how they reacted here in New York for Tommy dreamer, how they popped real big, uh, for the Dudley boy reunion. I could see how they would be really excited to see Van Dam with the big one. Yeah, I, I could too. I, I'm, I'm with you. Um, I just don't think that, that Rob was able to, or Vince was able to get his arms around Rob and from a confidence standpoint, you know, Rob's a 420 is marijuana, which I, it's no problem with me, right? but, Rob, but Rob's a marijuana, you know, advocate. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, that's all. Uh, I don't, I just don't think Vince had confidence in him. Uh, and I think that maybe he was due to some uh, external forces that didn't want to lose their foothold because Van Dam would have got over if he had gotten that opportunity. Well, listen, it's written all through the observer. I just didn't hammer it. A lot of people think that and it's even written in the observer that behind the scenes, people are blaming triple H for the belt coming off of uh, Lesnar and for the other belt going on to Sean. And, uh, this is the era where we start to see Hunter get more and more heat for some of these decisions. Was that the name you were hesitant to say that maybe you thought, oh, I think so. No, I, I, I think triple H was, he was take, he was also taking on a different role and he got, he continued to get more and more of a foothold with the old man. So, uh, but Van Dam was a threat to a lot of guys, right? Because he was unique and talented, uh, and for whatever reason, uh, the audience gravitated toward Rob. They liked him. They like watching his work. And that's why I think he would have been a, a great baby face champion. Another question here, or actually a compliment from Matt. He says, Hey Jim, not a question, but when you alluded to the elimination chamber as quote, the brutality of hell in a cell and the unpredictability of war games, I just thought that line was brilliant. Thank you for making big moments, even grander. How about that? That's nice. Hey, those things just pop in your head, man. Yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't, I'm not big about, uh, okay. Now I'll say this, you say that, and we'll say this together. Then we'll, then you breathe and I'll exhale. It's like watching kids get ready for a match nowadays. You know, they'll, they have a conference for 30 minutes over a five minute match, which I find to be totally embarrassing and unnecessary. That's get off my soapbox. Well, let's talk about the soapbox next week. We're going to be talking about clash of the champions. 21, one of the last big shows that Jim Ross is going to work for WCW. It's going to feature Barry Windham and dusty Rhodes wrestling, Ricky steamboat and Shane Douglas for the now unified NWA and WCW tag titles. We'll see sting take on Rick rude in a King of the cable tournament match. Medusa is going to wrestle Paul E. Yeah, that's a real thing. 
And we got Scotty Flamingo, who we know one day is going to be Raven taking on Johnny B bad in a boxing match, all that and more next week. As we break down WCW in an era where Jr. is maybe looking for greener pastures. Yeah. He's, he's, he's uh, scouting the, the, on the horizons. Uh, well, you know, that was just, that had to happen. You know, uh, Eric came in, he, he wanted, he got his own people to get his own formula that he wanted to utilize. I don't blame you for it whatsoever. I may have, I probably have done some similar things, but the one thing I wouldn't have done if I was Eric is get rid of Jr. No, I wouldn't have done that either. So, uh, but you know, and that, 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 that came up, drove a little wedge between, uh, my relationship with Eric in those days. It's ironic how things, if you just steer the course, uh, things have a way of working out. And now Eric's one of the guys that I, uh, enjoy reading about and talking about. And, and when I see him having a beer, uh, so it's just things can change, but that was, I was getting near the end of my run there, Connie. And, uh, this show will bring back a lot of memories. I can tell you, Hey, by the way, you mentioned Medusa on this uh, deal Yes. for next week. I watched, uh, uh, Tales lately, from the I territories, wa- right? Yeah. I watched her, uh, a to a W a experience. And how they put that thing together. That was a really entertaining show in my view. I loved it. Uh, yeah. I thought they did real well. I thought they had a, the inside rib was on, uh, the big guy, Kim Patera. Yes. It was always a bull- bullshitter <laughs> surprise. <laughs> so, and then, uh, uh, all those shows have been pretty damn well. I think, uh, rocks influence in that tales of the territory and his production team is, uh, absolutely phenomenal. So I, I'm a, and I'm, cr- I'm critical too, you know, obviously, uh, oh, by the way, I'm going to do, a. am going to do something with, uh, Evan and those dark side guys. How about uh, that? Getting the gang, the gang back together. Yeah. Uh, on the dog talk about JYD and probably of all the people living that went through the entire era, I might have a unique ups, up, uh, outlook on it. So we're going to record that here in the next few days. Uh, talk about dog's career and what he meant to that company and that territory and that part of the country. So, uh, I'm glad to be doing that with those guys, and try to do a good job for them and tell the story about the junkyard dog. Okay. I recommend adfreeshows.com. We've got a lot of his old WSB radio shows. We've got dozens of interviews with legends like Rick Rude, Jesse Ventura, and Larry Zabrisco, all available for you now. Over, I need all the laughs and all the fun that I can muster. So, uh, but I want to thank all the folks out there that have followed my story. I try not to be too over poor me. You know, uh, you know, I need your help. I'm going to start a GoFundMe page. No. Jeez, God damn. No, I'm not. I am appreciative and I thank folks for taking the time out of their day. You mentioned earlier about taking the time out of your day and doing a five-star review. Yeah. You have time to do it. If you got a company that you're, or you're supporting and they got all these reviews, uh, then damn man, uh, that ain't, that, that's, that's it. That's a, that's a, that's a great endorsement. Yes. So for you guys follow me and on Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff, uh, I, I appreciate it very much. And I can guarantee you. Wasn't that many years ago where I would even know what Twitter and Facebook were. I know now, yes, and I did. appreciate you guys helping me out <laughs> and, uh, with your encouragement, it means a whole hell of a lot. Seriously. Check it out. JRsbbq.com. Something for everybody. Lots of cool stuff on there, including signed trading cards, but, uh, do yourself a favor, pick up some sauce. Uh, I know you probably want to put it on a shelf to display it. Go ahead and order two, one to try and one to display. You'll be glad you did. Uh, and we'll be back next week talking Clash of the Champions right here on Grillin' JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Thanks, everybody, for listening, Conrad. Great job as always. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, count your blessings. Nothing's more important than our health. God bless you. See you next week right here. Yep. For the first time ever, StarCast goes international. Oceania Pro Wrestling and Visit Victoria present StarCast Down Under, set to take Ballarat, Victoria by storm from April 11th through to April 14th. 
bringing the StarCast experience to Australia. And with all the staples of StarCast that have made it a wrestling fan's dream destination, meet and greets with your favorite wrestling stars of yesterday and today. Live stage shows including a Sunday with Bret Hart, a retrospective on his Hall of Fame career, including a special watch-along celebration of the 30th anniversary of the Hitman's legendary WrestleMania 10 match against his brother Owen. Also including an audience Q&A with the excellence of execution. We'll also have live wrestling shows, in-ring action including Mickey James's all-women show, Her, and a special supercard, Bret Hart's Australian Stampede. All this along with the photo ops, autographs, merch and memorabilia, making balance are at the place to be this April. Never before has a weekend like this taken place in Australia until now. StarCast Down Under, presented by Oceania Pro Wrestling and Visit Victoria. Tickets are available now. Visit StarCast.com for more information. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson here to tell you a little more about what adfreeshows.com is all about. Get early ad-free access to more than a dozen of your favorite wrestling podcasts every single week starting at just nine bucks that's less than 20 cents an episode each month and yes you can listen to them all directly through apple podcasts or your regular podcast apps how easy is that ad free shows also has thousands of hours worth of bonus content and docuseries like title chase eric fires back conversations with conrad and the insiders Plus new series like The Book with David Crockett, Monday Mailbags with Mike Kyoto and Nick Patrick, and a whole lot more. And you want to talk about early. You can't get any earlier than listening to the shows live. You can be a part of the live studio audience as we record the podcast. Plus ride shotgun alongside your favorite childhood heroes for live watch-alongs, Q&As, and other interactive experiences every single month. Come on now, see for yourself what thousands of other wrestling fans from around the world have discovered that adfreeshows.com is the best value in wrestling. Check it out today. And hey, when you do, the first week is completely free. Adfreeshows.com. <laughs> 